All right, so welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, I am talking about one of my favorite up and coming designers, Peter Doe. Um, but before I continue, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Fashion Roadman, where I post a little bit about everything, about recent stuff that's going on in fashion, and also a bit of fashion history. So for a brief overview on who Peter Doe is, Peter Doe is an American women's wear designer based in Brooklyn, New York. And he's kind of known for his time working at Celine under Phoebe Philo. He also studied fashion design at FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology. And you can see a lot of Phoebe Philo's influence in his work and he has said on many occasions that he learned how to tailor and he learned a lot of his concrete fashion design skills from his time working under Phoebe Philo at Celine. Now when Peter Doe was studying at FIT he won the LVMH Graduates Prize. Now this is very different to what people know as the LVMH Prize. The LVMH Prize is what everyone knows about and it's kind of the popular prize and that's what where people get this massive award. I think it's like $400,000 or euros or something crazy like that. And support for your brand, that's the main prize. But there's also something called the LVMH Graduate Prize. And the LVMH Graduates Prize, you win, I think 10,000. And you also get a chance to work for a brand under the LVMH umbrella. So of course, Celine is under the LVMH umbrella. And this is why Peter Doe was able to work at Celine um, for two years before he finally quit. Now, in terms of design aesthetic, Peter Doe is very much obsessed with menswear and he likes tailoring silhouettes of menswear. In many interviews, he talks about this idea of taking cues from a menswear tailoring aesthetic and silhouette and injecting it into women's wear. So he's making really feminine garments, but he's adding the structure that you would associate with menswear. Another reason why he's obsessed with menswear is that he states that he feels like menswear is most of the time made to last because men buy clothing more often. And when men buy clothing, they're normally buying something to wear for a long time. Whereas women, when it comes to fashion, they're a bit more erratic with how they wear clothes, they buy more clothes, they buy different types of clothes. And he, he likes this idea of making things to last and building a cohesive wardrobe. And he feels like menswear more so um, brings that more to the table than women's wear. And to quote him directly, how he normally describes it is he's taking a menswear philosophy and creating women's wear from that men's philosophy. What I really love about Peter Doe and the brand Peter Doe is his ability to just focus on the craftsmanship and the garments and even his demeanor. It really reminds me of Martin Magella because Peter Doe is very incognito. He doesn't like to show his face. You can't really see his face anywhere. The only way you can really recognize him, he has this crazy tattoo that's like a line from his left ear all the way to his hand. So that's an easy way to identify who it is. But other than that, you can't really find images of his face online. And it's mainly because he feels like the focus should be on the clothing. It shouldn't really be about him. And he's always been a private person. It's not like a fad or he's trying to create this kind of name for himself and be seen as like Margiela. I was reading an interview where he was talking about how he used to hide his family portraits at home because he didn't want people to come to the house and see his face, which I thought was quite interesting. To quote what he said, he said, I just don't like my face being memorialized. And besides, the brand should be focused on the clothing, not the designer. And I totally agree. I totally agree. And I think a lot of brands, when they start to have their downfall is when designers become a bit too big for their boots and the focus becomes less on the actual product that brought them to that stage and they start to focus on them. Um, I always feel like that's the downfall to many brands, not mentioning any names, of course. Now from the launch of the brand, it was clear that the focus from 2018 when it was launched would be on functionality and wearability. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. I know in the sphere of high-end fashion, making things that are too wearable are seen as making things that are too commercial or safe. But Peter Doe's designs are not safe. They're not overly commercial. They're just made to be wearable, but they're very, very complicated in terms of the way they're constructed, the high quality in which they're constructed, and 
the many different silhouettes that you get wearing Peter Doe. Because Peter Doe has such a stiff focus on functionality, a lot of his designs are very utilitarian. I mean, there are some garments that you wouldn't expect to have pockets, like a dress or a skirt that have pockets, because once again, he's more about function. And in his interviews, he talks about him making clothing for the everyday woman, the woman that does tasks, the woman that's a busy woman. She does many different physical activities in a day, and he wants the clothing to be very comfortable for the wearer, but at the same time, make the wearer look chic and beautiful at the same time. And that's why he has all those different things in place in his designs. And this is where I say his clothing reminds me of Phoebe Philo. When you look at it deeply, they don't look the same, but in terms of the philosophy and kind of, there's a slight resemblance in terms of the functionality, the wearability, making beautiful clothes. Phoebe Philo never made ultra avant-garde clothes that were just artworks or sculptures. Phoebe Philo used to make clothing that was revolutionary. It changed the way we used to dress and I say we, it changed the way women used to dress and it changed the way women thought they could style certain things. At the same time, Phoebe Philo was making extremely high quality clothing and clothing that just fit perfectly on a woman and made a woman um, beautiful and obviously elevated the style of the everyday woman. Reading one of his interviews, I found something really interesting. What he said was that the jacket linings possess a signature pleating that expands when the wearer moves. And a lot of the knitwear is made to be extremely warm to avoid excessive layering in colder climates. And I think that's insane, because here he said, the signature pleating that expands when the wearer moves. And I think this is why he talks about making clothing for women that are actually physically active and doing many different tasks at work, because a lot of luxury fashion is like, luxury doesn't have to be comfortable, you just have to look good, and they're so restrictive, and you can barely um, do any tasks when a lot of these brands. And I do like that, that he's taken the steps to make sure that it's very comfortable to wear, even down to the minute details like the linings of a jacket. Now, I have a few interesting quotes um, that Peter Doe has made. So one of them is, I like to watch people, and when I see them struggling, it inspires me to fix it. They should just be able to grab whatever in the morning and know they look good. And later in the video, I'm going to get into this idea where a lot of his designs are made to solve problems, and that's what he's talking about, where he likes to watch people and see them struggling and it inspires him to fix their problems because a lot of his designs, like I said, I'll get into later in this video, he talks about this idea where he was asking his friends what their problems are with their clothing and then incorporating those issues and kind of fixing them in his own brand. Clothes for women to live in. Clothes for women who get stuff done and look cool doing it and are above reworking their wardrobes every season to account for silly trends. And I'm a big fan of this. I've made videos where I talked about why you shouldn't like buy into fashion trends because at the end of the day, it's not even sustainable and there's many different reasons that I can get into in this video, but I won't because this video is about Peter Doe. Now, going to Peter Doe fixing problems, to quote what he said, he said, I asked around to all my friends and colleagues what do you like? What do you wear? What do you see missing in your wardrobe? What do you hate? What do you hate about your sweater? Is it not warm enough? And he said that these type of questions that he was asking his friends and people he knows and their responses fueled his creative process to make sure that he fixed these little things in his production from the comfortability of it or maybe something not being too warm or being too cold and different things like that. And I feel like he took it to the next level in terms of making clothing that was perfect for the wearer. And I don't think many brands, unless we're talking about tech wear brands where the focus of the brand is literally performance, actually consider things like this. But I think we can talk about the garment details and how beautiful the clothing is forever, but I think it would be a waste to talk about Peter Doe without discussing garment innovation and how much he puts into his fabric research. So when Peter Doe was actually still a student at FIT, he developed a new fabric that he calls Spacer, which I thought was really interesting to talk about. 
and he made this garment. Now when describing the fabric, he says he took a transparent cloth material, typically used in aviation and construction, and made it thinner, less spongy, and more suitable for clothing. What this means is that garments made with the fabrics look very sheer, but they firmly retain their shapes, and the fabric appears delicate to the eye, but it's actually surprisingly very versatile and durable. And like he has described, it holds the sharp, graceful lines of his designs, even intricate pleating details. Now this fabric is very much likened to neoprene, which is sort of like a synthetic rubber. And Spacer is one of those materials that is very well insulated. It's machine washable. And best of all, it rarely wrinkles. And I think saying that it rarely wrinkles is really important because the Spacer fabric that he synthesized, it looks very similar to Organza. However, Organza wrinkles a lot. So yeah, it's an amazing fabric. And I think sometimes we take for granted the amount of work that these designers and these brands put into these garments. We just receive the product and we're like, why is it so expensive? Meanwhile, he's a small brand, so economies of scale, and then he's creating products of a high quality. And of course, he's not trying to overscale. But turning back the clock, I find Peter Lowe's transition from Celine to making his own brand really fascinating. So I'm going to touch on that really quickly. So while working at Celine and seeing how Phoebe Philo works, Peter Doe decided that he wanted to be the author of his own path. He decided that he wanted to be the type of designer that creates his own garments for his own brand rather than work his way up in many different fashion houses and then maybe one day become the creative director. So just after two years working at Celine, he quit his job to move back to New York and kind of focus on how he would create his own brand. And in the meantime, he worked for Derek Lamb. And it was really interesting because working at Derek Lamb and being back home in New York gave him this idea to just sit back, earn a living working at Derek Lamb, but at the same time, have the resources and have the time to be able to kind of come up with a plan for creating his own namesake brand. So one of the first things he did when he moved back to New York was scout a lot of his talented friends that he had made over the years. Some of them were from his Tumblr days and friends he made um, from Tumblr. Some were working with him at Celine and then some were just friends that he knew just from working in the industry and just connections in general. Till today, he actually refers to these members and himself as the Peter Doe Five, which I find quite fascinating. And the Peter Doe fashion brand in general, the way they work, there's a lot of unity in terms of the way the brand operates. And that's why I find it interesting that he coined him and the four people he recruited as the Peter Doe Five because it just further spreads that message of unity within his fashion house. So of course, the four people he recruited accepted to work with him to create his own brand. Um, so I have here all the four people he recruited initially. So there's someone called Lydia, who was formerly a designer at Calvin Klein. Vincent, who was working in sales at Celine. Anne, who's a photographer. And Jessica, who's a stylist and was actually a stylist for Peter Doe's thesis collection when he was still at FIT. Now to talk about how the brand is marketed, everything is done through social media and Instagram. And the Instagram account is used as a way to direct traffic onto his web store, as well as a way for stockists to just see what he's doing and see his garments. It's kind of like an electronic showroom, so to speak. Over the years, Peter Doe has managed to build a great relationship with a lot of stockists and he's stocked in so many places now. Um, he's stocked in Dover Street Market London. I see his clothes in DSM all the time. I know he's stocked in Dover Street Market Ginza, and I know he's stocked in so many other places as well. Reading an interview, he was talking about why he hasn't done a runway show, and he was basically describing that he will always favor the consumers first, and he feels like the money he could use spending it on runways or expensive PR companies, he could just put that back into like garment research or back into making better fabrics or improving the garments. And I really, really appreciate that because so many brands right now, they just focus on 
getting in as many faces and trying to upscale and the quality just goes down the drain. And that has happened to so many luxury brands. It's unbelievable, like Prada, Gucci, there's a lot of brands where the quality has just gone down the absolute drain. Um, and I really like that he's one of those designers that still focuses on craftsmanship and the quality of the actual garment. And it's interesting to see that a luxury brand can be very successful and respected only being marketed primarily on Instagram because for most luxury brands, they rely on expensive shows and this big bravado and excess to kind of sell to consumers that they're worth the price and that they're a luxury brand. And I think why this works for most luxury brands is because the average consumer is not very educated and the average consumer does not know like feeling a fabric how much better one fabric can be in terms of quality than another fabric or how much it actually costs to make something of like 100% wool versus like a synthetic type of material that's cheaper but made to kind of have the properties of wool. I don't think consumers are very educated on what, on what a garment that is long lasting feels like and what it isn't. And of course the people that watch this channel are most likely very educated about fashion and are very informed consumers. But if we look at fashion on a wider sense, um, most of the consumers are not very educated and it's very easy to convince the average consumer by having expensive shows and having celebrities at your shows that your brand is luxury or it's worth a certain amount of money. So I really love that on the flip side, Peter Lowe's brand is all about authenticity and craftsmanship and he even says that the brand was made on Instagram because people have kind of followed his journey from the start of the brand on Instagram where they're going to Ikea, getting furniture, getting supplies and people feel that they're a part of the Peter Doe community. And I don't feel like any other brand can say that because brands like big corporations, they're always like Louis Vuitton or Gucci. It seems like they're trying to sell you stuff. It's not really authentic. And I feel like it's very interesting that Peter Doe has this very distinctive way of having an authentic way of marketing his brand that isn't selling out. And to quote Peter Doe, he said, the garment district in Midtown is dying because people are outsourcing overseas and want things to be cheaper and cheaper. We just don't work that way. It's really important for me to have a dialogue with one seamstress and the pattern cutters who make your garment. And once again, this is why I say that quality and craftsmanship is at the heart of what Peter Doe does. And just to talk about what a lot of luxury brands do, and I know this because I've worked for three high-end brands. Um, what a lot of luxury brands do, not the brands I worked for, they were very much focused on sustainability because I worked at Deploy, Stella McCartney, and I worked at Pallone's more recently, and these are all three sustainable women's wear brands. But when you work in the industry, you kind of learn what other people do because there's people that have worked where I've worked, that have worked at Balenciaga or Gucci, and they tell you these things. For example, what a lot of luxury brands do when they decide that they want to hit a billion dollar target or whatever target they're set by the conglomerate that owns the brand, they have to cut costs one way and another. And one way they do this is, let's say their production is in Italy, which production in Italy isn't always necessarily good because there's documentaries showing that there's some factories in Italy where the working conditions are probably even worse than China, but it just has the name made in Italy. Um, but they move their production from Italy to somewhere like China to cut costs. And what that does is people start to think that Anything made in China is low quality, but I think why China gets a bad rap in terms of that is the reason why brands produce in China. Every time I've seen a luxury brand like Balenciaga with their Triple S, for example, move production from Italy or France or London, wherever, to China, is specifically for two reasons. It's either the demand for the product is so high and there's no factory in the West that can produce the numbers they need, so they have to make it in China, or they just want it to be produced cheaper. And this is the exact reason why you buy a Prada loafer right now, and these loafers cost like 700 pounds, like 800, 900 dollars, and they're not even stitched together. They're glued together, like it's, it's literally embarrassing. Like how can you sell something 
for a footwear for 800 pounds and have it reinforced with glue that is just absolutely atrocious and it's it's shameful and it's quite interesting because i've worked with a brand where we used to produce in china and i remember when we first were sampling things and we told um this chinese factory what we wanted and our head designer kind of designed what they wanted design the patterns and everything and we got the samples and it was so cheap and we were like no like change this for this fabric and they were like it's going to cost you this much more to produce and we're like we don't care we want to make a luxury this is a luxury brand and then when the samples came back when we told them we wanted luxury they were some of the highest quality fabrics i've ever felt in my life and that stuff is from china but i think even in china the 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 factories are so used to Western companies coming to China and wanting to cut corners that they intrinsically just give you the low quality thing first and then you have to push and be like, no, actually, we want it to be luxury and then they produce the luxury garment. And in China, they have the means to produce every single level. It's just that most times when people go to China, they want to cut costs. So most things that come out of China then are at that low level. But if you really want high level produced garments, it's there in China. And I say all of this to say, this is why I'm a big fan of Peter Doe because he recognizes this and he doesn't want to be a part of this whole system of trying to be a million dollar company and then trying to be a billion dollar company and then you cut costs and then garment quality suffers and many different things suffer and he always focuses on the garment that the consumer is going to get at the end of it over everything else and i'm a big fan of that i also love that he does two collections a year it reminds me very much of dries van noten not wanting to overproduce and i really hope that he maintains this ethos of the brand because it's so good and i really hope he doesn't sell out that's my big hope and to even talk more about sustainability and peter doe i think the space of fabric embodies sustainability because it's a fabric that is made to last and sustainability as many different ways a brand can be sustainable one big way is by making products that last a very long time therefore limiting how quickly it goes to landfills and as we know fashion is the second highest polluting industry behind the petroleum industry and to quote what he said about this he said if we could all go back to making real clothes again and not make as much pieces that are good and informed and this just shows that he has the right mindset in terms of making clothing the brand also reuses leftover fabric from past seasons that they don't fully finish and that's also an amazing thing because there are many different luxury brands not mentioning names once again um, that once they're done with a fabric or a different collection they just destroy everything because they don't want because they don't want the brand to be watered down when in actual fact they could have just produced less. Um, so yeah, that's a whole nother thing. But to be very constructive about Peter Doe and the brand, because I don't want this video to come off like I'm just a Peter Doe fan and he can do no wrong. Um, I want to be a fashion journalist and I'm an aspiring fashion journalist. So I have to have a critical eye on things and kind of be able to constructively critique brands um, and what I like about them, what I dislike. So to be constructive about what I necessarily, it's not like I don't like it about Peter Doe, but what can be improved. I feel like Peter Doe leans into the fact that he worked for Phoebe Philo at Celine a bit too much. I think he leans into it too much. And I'm not saying it's maybe him that does it. Maybe it's the way he's covered because there's all these articles where they're like, if you are reminiscing about old Celine and Phoebe Philo's time at Celine, then check out Peter Doe or check out what Daniel Lee, who also worked under Phoebe Philo, is doing with, with Bottega Veneta. And I feel they use working under Phoebe Philo at Celine as kind of a marketing tool. And I would much rather see, especially Daniel Lee and Peter Doe, I'm going to say, lean into themselves and kind of take credit for their own work because I feel like Daniel Lee and Peter Doe are two designers that are incredibly good at what they do and I feel like they should try more to pivot away from using Phoebe Philo as like a marketing tool as like we know our stuff because we worked under Phoebe Philo and more just 
hone into themselves and find an aesthetic of clothing that's very, very more distinctive to them. Um, so that's, if I was going to be very constructive, that's the one thing I will say. Because what I've noticed in fashion is once someone studies fashion design at Central St. Martins or they work under Martin Magella or they work under Phoebe Fallot at Celine, it makes them immune to criticism. And then when a designer is immune to criticism, they're going to start to get a bit full of themselves, which I've seen happen. And I hope it doesn't happen to Peter Doe and Daniel Lee. Um, and they start to almost not design as good as they once did, but because there's yes men around them and no one to actually be constructive about their work, they kind of just, for lack of a better term, get lost in their own source. And McQueen actually made a really good quote about this. It's on my phone. Let me go get my phone so I can read out this quote. Okay, so McQueen Vault, which is an amazing page on McQueen on Instagram, and this guy knows everything about Alexander McQueen there is to know. He's read every single book. He posted a McQueen quote um, on his page that I thought was absolutely amazing in terms of bringing my point across. Now to quote what McQueen said, he said, I know because of my tailoring background, Savile Row and that, I get away with a lot. And let's face it, there's a lot of getting away with it going on in fashion. And I could not agree more. I literally could not agree more because McQueen is literally owning up to the fact that because he interned at Savile Row, and Savile Row is known as the mecca for tailoring in Europe, that he knows that whenever he makes a suit, it doesn't matter how the suit is made, he gets away with it because people are just gonna say he worked at Savile Row, so the suit's amazing. Not even looking at the details of the suit, they just make that assumption from the get-go because of his background. And he said, and let's face it, there's a lot of getting away with it in fashion. And I. I couldn't agree more. So much of that does go on in fashion. And that's why when I'm being constructive about designers in terms of critiquing their work, um, I have to look past where they've designed or where they've worked. And to further bring my point across, there's an academic paper on Prada. It's called Prada and the Art of Patronage. And someone from this channel, um, one of the people that follows this channel actually um, recommended that I read it and it was amazing. It's one of the best academic papers I've ever read. And this academic paper talks about how Prada, whether they mean to or not, Muta Prada is someone that's into art and artistic fashion. However, there's a way that she's tactically marketed Prada as like this brand that's associated with high level art and architecture and the way that she's collaborated with architects that Prada is then put on that pedestal. And this academic paper was critiquing to what extent this is genuine and is, is it really Muta Prada being a fan of these architects and artwork as a whole or is it really Muta Prada using high level art and using very well respected architects and collaborating with them knowing fully well that if she collaborates with these people that are seen as such a high level of art, that Prada will then be put on that same high level of art and will be associated with it. Um, but yeah, that's all I really have to say. Um, in conclusion, I'm a really big fan of Peter Doe. I love everything he does. I love the garments. I love his mindset. Um, and I really look forward to um, his work in the future. What I will say is I hope he makes menswear because his woman's wear is fantastic. Of course, he's a woman's wear designer, but I am six foot three. And unfortunately, I can't wear any brand that only makes women's wear because it's too small. Um, so Peter though, if you're watching this, if you make men's wear, please make it in big sizes and I will buy your whole range every single time. I will save up money and I will buy a lot of your clothing, especially the tailoring. But on that note, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Like this video if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Um, if you want to support this channel financially, I will greatly appreciate it if you subscribe to my Patreon. The link to that is in the description below. And apart from supporting this channel, you also get access to exclusive content on Patreon. If that gives you any incentive to subscribe to my Patreon. Um, in other news, I'm working on my magazine, as a lot of people know. And pre-orders for my magazine and merch, which will just be tote bags. Um, will start late next month, hopefully. 
um, if I work on my timelines correctly. But on that note, thank you very much for watching this video. I greatly appreciate everyone that takes time out of their day to watch these videos. And I'll be back again with another video really soon. Thank you.